thank you everyone for uh, joining uh, this IM chat session. Our guest for today is Karan Bajaj, as you know. Uh, many of you may have heard of him. Uh, he was in the news. Uh, he sold his EdTech startup, uh, White Hat Junior, to buy news. Uh, he's had an interesting career with stints in marketing, consulting, uh, business leadership roles, um, and uh, more recently, entrepreneurship. Uh, along the way, he also managed to write three books uh, and take a, a couple of sabbaticals, or as he calls them, growth events. We're really looking forward to this conversation with Karan, and our moderator today is uh, Rahul Phonke. So, Rahul, let me hand over to you. And right. Karan. Thanks, Deepika. You stole all my good lines, so I got nothing much to say. So, uh, welcome, Karan. You know, a uh, uh, wise old man had once said that in order to find yourself, you need to lose yourself first. And I know these words to be quite true because actually the wise old man who said that was me. So our guest this evening, ladies and gentlemen, has done all that and found himself and found much more. And what seems to be a movie story all by itself, let us hear more from the man himself, Karan Bajaj. So Karan, on behalf of the Pan IM alumni community in Singapore, let me formally welcome you to IM Chat. Pleasure to be here. Thank yeah. you. Thank you for having me. All right. So uh, before we start, just a few rules for the uh, participants. Uh, I'll be asking, and the format of today's uh, one hour long uh, webinar, uh, I'll be asking Karan a few questions for the first 20 odd minutes or so, after which we'll be basically opening it up to the questions from the participants. The idea is it's structured as a you know free flowing, frank and open talk and not a meet the press kind of session where we only have politically correct platitudes. So basically the chat house rules apply and participants can write in their questions using the uh, Q&A feature on Zoom. So Karan, uh, before we start, just to kind of small uh, trivia for you. Uh, you know, the last three participants on this IAN chat were uh, Raghunam Rajan, Indra Nui, and Rahul Gandhi. So no pressure there, but uh, <laughs> so you're an illustrious fourth wheel of that uh, same sequence. Uh, so Karan, my first question to you will be, you know, most of the people here uh, know you for your recent, you know, startup exit. Uh, but obviously you had a very interesting 10 to 12 years before that as well. Can you just give us a window seat on that, you know, 10 years journey before the entrepreneurial venture took off? Uh, sure. Uh, 10 years, um, um, I think started, the, or, or I would say, yeah, the last 12 years, I would say, have been... Um, uh, quite interesting, I would say, where I would say the starting point was that in uh, 2008, right, that was, I was about six years into my career. So I graduated from IM in 2002. Uh, in 2008, I left my job for a year, uh, Procter & Gamble, and I was, I, I was still then I lived in Singapore also uh, with PNG, but I left PNG in 2008 to just travel, right? So I traveled for a year and uh, during that I wrote my first novel, right? So I think that was a bit of a turning point in my life. After writing the first novel, I think, uh, the subsequent 10 years have in some form or the other, uh, what I, I had this very profound moment where after I wrote my first novel, which was quite, uh, that was quite a common event, right? I wrote my novel, I published it. I started to write my second novel, right? I remember a very clear feeling. I felt that my well was empty, right? Everything I knew I had poured into my first book. And then I think that really started a life on a trajectory where I was very eager and curious and hungry for new experiences to keep filling the well, right? So I think that was a very profound moment because I think after that I wrote my first novel, then I wrote my second novel, uh, took another year off to uh, to uh, like to learn yoga and meditation. Wrote my third novel, took a year off to write again, uh, to to kind of go very deep into yoga. Then became a full time writer for a while. Came back, became the discovery CEO. It was a very last twelve years have been in this constantly very profound experimentative creative phase, right? So I think for me, I if I had only one thought, I wish I had built my first thing early, like my created my first thing early. It could have been a novel, it could have been something else, but one profound act of creation, if it, if it had come into my life early, I think uh, rather than the last 12 years, the last 20 years would have been this very, I would say very, um, just like a very deep engagement with life, right? Because I was constantly in the spirit of like uh, learning a lot so that I could create more and then uh, creating, then again, feeling empty, learning more, creating, you know, I got into this really creation zone which I think is the most powerful thing to happen to a person. Yeah. So, you know, one question I had, uh, and you briefly alluded to it anyway, but yeah. you lived the life of the, you know, Indian kid of the 80s, 90s, where the aspirational template for most, uh, particularly for yeah. boys, 
was a IIT bits RDC degree followed by IIM XLRI followed by MNC posting, which you also followed to yeah, to, yeah. to an extent. To and uh, you know what I mean. Although you say the well was empty, what really was made that push into a shove? Because it's not like many other people might also find them similar positions. You know, kind of finding a bit of emptiness right. in their life, but. Only no one really, no, I, at least I don't know many people who go that way with actually cut their ties loose. So what was I that? Think uh, uh, I, I think it's very easy. It's all about the first leap. The first leap is very hard, right? So the first leap, uh, I had the same self-doubt, etc. that anybody would have, right? That uh, when I was taking the first leap, which was when I was leaving a job uh, without a job lined up, right? And I was uh, just doing uh, traveling. I was single that time. So that made it a little easier. But the first leap is the hardest, right? Now, um, so, so, so I was racked with self-doubt the same way, right? Because I was leaving my job and I didn't know where I would come back to. But uh, I just took six months and I kind of backpacked through South America, the uh, South America and then Eastern Europe, right? For me, actually, the best part is um, at the end of the first leap, I lived my worst case uh, right off the gate, right? So I, I, when I left the US, it was January 2008. I backpacked for about nine months. I came back in October 2008. October 2008 is when Lehman had collapsed, right? Uh, the same month, the same day I came back to the US, the day before that Lehman had collapsed, right? So I kind of lived my nightmare out right off the gate, right? The, the worst thing that you can expect after the, 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 the all your fears, right? That you'll be without a job. Uh, it, it kind of, I lived that completely, right? Because at 29, right? Uh, I was age 29. I was without a job, right? I was, uh, I had no money left because I traveled for nine months, right? Uh, using the money that I had. And I was on my sister's couch in the US, sleeping on my sister's couch, looking for a job, right? And that was around the time when everybody in the IM, uh, my batchmates and stuff were uh, sending those pictures on Yahoo group about like getting married and their first kids and the houses they were buying. And I had hit hot rock, I just hit complete rock bottom, right? In a way that was very good, right? Because after it, two, three months later, I found a job with BCG. Right. And then I restarted my life again. So I kind of like had this, uh, like it had kind of started to sink in that look, uh, things work out, right? Uh, like they do work out. So, so like, as long as you're kind of, uh, following some kind of a growth imperative, right. It will eventually work out. Right. So, so then subsequently the leaps became easier, right? The second leap now, every time there's a level of complexity, the second time I left to do, I left my job to do yoga and meditation for a year, uh, Right, I live in an ashram for a year. Um, I had my wife uh, or my wife, uh, my partner at that time, right? Uh, so you had the whole thing of like, you had to do it now with two people. The third time I left it, I had kids, right? I left my job to become a writer in New York. So then I had kids. So you, each time you, some complexity adds, but I think I lived my uh, like nightmare after the first time and I was okay, right? I realized that you could find a job again. By the second time I had a different conclusion, right? After I left my job to do yoga and meditation for a year, live in an ashram. When I came back to my job or came back to a job, uh, I did supremely well. I really accelerated. So I started to kind of get this feeling then that, look, if you're choosing very dramatic growth uh, in, in, in a vector, the world actually rewards you for that uh, in, in the output, right? Because if you've grown tremendously as a human being, uh, in, in some form or the other, your professional life will reward you for it, right? So that started to sink in the second time over, right? Because when I came back, I got promoted very early, uh, then I, you know, and I realized that that was because uh, I had grown so much in that year of doing yoga and uh, like fully living in an ashram and writing that, uh, or, or like really becoming a yoga teacher and stuff that I, the world rewarded me for that, right? So by the time I took my latest leap, which is to leave Discovery as the CEO in India and start a startup, like I was very comfortable that look, uh, even if this doesn't work out, right, I'm going to grow so much in building a tech startup that proportionally I'll be rewarded for it in some form or the other, right? So I became very comfortable with the leaps after that. So, yeah. Kar, I mean, the backpacking story is, you know, honestly, also unusual on its own. But then the almost a year-long stint in the ashram is even more unusual. So, but yeah. one more thing after that phase, you know, after kind of discovering yourself and discovering the simple things in life, you would have perhaps kissed the material world, you know, goodbye and good night. So what made you come back and take the entrepreneurial plunge? See, what happened is that I think my biggest learning after the end of that year, right, living in the ashram was, I didn't go with the intent that I would live in an ashram for a year, by the way, right? So what had happened was that uh, uh, my mom had passed away from cancer very early, in her early 50s or so, right? Uh, right at the time I was around, uh, like in, in my early 30s, right? She had passed away. 
And I, I'd always been very pulled from my IM days. I'd been very pulled to the Buddhism and yoga and stuff, right? The text of it. So I, um, I really got into this, like, what is human suffering and uh, like, uh, what is moksha, enlightenment, nirvana? Is there a way out of the birth? And like, you know, the classic spiritual quest, right? So when I left that time, I was quite comfortable with this idea that I would uh, like be a monk, right? And never come back sort of a thing, right? I was very comfortable with this idea that I'm going to take the plunge and really get into it. So I, I was very in the ashram. It was like 60, 70 people in a room, one bathroom, like cold showers in the Himalayas. It was like very austere kind of living, right? And I was doing strong yoga practices, right? But I think somehow at the end of the year, right? This Indian concept of dharma is very powerful, right? Which is basically the tree can only be a tree. It can't become the river. The tree has an innate tendency to grow and bear fruit, right? That's the dharma of the tree. And the river's dharma is to flow. The tree can't look at the river and say that the river is doing a better job. Let me do that, right? It's the innate tendency of the tree. So somewhere during that year, I, I got this very clear sense of dharma, right? I thought that my dharma... I do. I like doing large-scale creation projects, right? I'm I'm very good at like uh, kind of building things and trying to project them at a large scale, right? Whether that's launching a TV channel or when I write a novel, I want it to be a great bestseller. I want thousands, millions of people to read it. So I, I'm good at like creating things and and kind of propagating them or wanting to propagate, or at least whether I do it or not. But I was good at like creation of large-scale projects, right? So I like that. I thought that was my dharma. So when I came back, I came back with a lot of certainty, right? That I would, and, and immediately after that, I became the CEO of Discovery, launched a bunch of TV channels there. Then I like started my own company. And I always liked this idea of like scaling things very large, right? Uh, creative projects that are very large scale impact, right? So I, I kind of figured out that that was my dharma. So it's given me a lot of clarity that I'm uh, at my most spiritual if I'm following that path rather than uh, being a monk. That's not my journey in this lifetime, you know? Yeah, that's why yeah, I came back. Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, and that really is a bit of a unique perspective on your decision. Uh, but coming to the, you know, the elephant in the room, your latest exit, because even by purely entrepreneurial standards, one rarely yeah. sees an you know, Indian startups making an exit for $300 million and the figures going to keep on coming back like a bad coal, you know, in less than 24 months after being founded, thereby right. making you the only man to have a smile on his face in this year. Uh, <laughs> Can you tell us a bit more about, you know, what, what really made this, I would say, super accelerated growth and exit and what, what made it the white hat legend? I mean, um, see, there's so many circumstances that come together, right? I was in an industry, EdTech was an industry that suddenly got a, like a major kind of wind in the COVID. So I, I don't want to take too much credit beyond uh, like uh, a little bit more than being right place at the right time. Obviously, I executed well, but in general... I would say there's a good amount of fortune that goes into all of this, right? But I would say, let me be more brutally honest, right? I was coming back after two very big failures, right? Uh, my third novel, I took five years to write it. One year living in an ashram, I was trying to kind of formulate it. Then in New York, I was a full-time writer for 18 months, right? Uh, I had two small kids and I had taken the plunge into writing full-time, right? I was really, and then I, and I launched it also, like uh, Random House published it all over the world. And it was a disaster from the start, right? It sold far lesser than my earlier novels. It had to be remaindered, which means that it had to be sold on discount. So I came out of that failure, right? Then I became the Discovery CEO in India, right? Uh, uh, then uh, the Discovery CEO in India, to be honest, I was probably the worst CEO in India in Discovery, right? It was a very stable organization for many years. They wanted somebody to shake it up. I came, I shook it up, but I didn't succeed in any of the big moves I had planned. So I was smarting a lot after two back-to-back -back very big creative failures. Now, at a certain scale, right? Obviously, my novel was published. I was the CEO, right? So, like, these were not like abject failures, but they were reasonably big failures in my world or in the world that I was in, right? Uh, so, I'd learned a lot, right? I'd learned that I have to be ruthlessly executing day in, day out uh, with complete detail orientation, right? I think most startups uh, end up not running with that level of single minded detail orientation, right? So, I was the CEO who was reading every lesson, looking at every sales figure, picking up every call center call, framing uh, in the beginning, framing what the, the business should be. So I would say extreme level of operating discipline to the last degree and, and very strong principles, right? We had this 10, 10, 6 rule, uh, fashion out of Alibaba that uh, in the interview, we would say that, look here, the working hours are, the official working hours are 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. for six days a week. We were very clear. I was very clear right off the beginning, 10 a.m. to 10 p.m., six days a week. Uh, these are the official working hours here. And uh, 
you know, you either come in knowing that or you don't come at all, right? So I was very clear that this is all about last mile, end-to-end -end operating, detail-oriented, end-to-end execution, right? That's how a startup works. Too much time is going into investor meetings and all that is useless, right? None of this makes a difference, right? Operation, operating control to the last degree. And I was a little bit loose in my discovery stint as a CEO. I felt I was too empowering, too hands-off, too much into the png style of leadership, which is really empower people, this, that, right? Startups don't run like that. Startups run on hardcore operation end-to-end, -end, you know, um, if you will. So it was very good detail-oriented execution to the last degree. Yeah. So, you know, uh, uh, alumnus of uh, IMA and who actually went on to also found the fund and sell exit the unicorn. And he exited, the unicorn still ex uh, is going run by his fellow co-founders. He had once mentioned to me, Raul, if you're uh, if you're starting a startup to get rich, you're already doing it for the wrong reasons. Uh, was that is that your philosophy as well when you started Vita? Do you, actually no, I don't. Uh, I I have a different uh, point of view at all. Actually, the truth is, see, um, see, yeah. So so I think obviously you need to start a startup knowing that ninety percent of the time it's going to fail, right? Uh, 9% of the time, it's going to give you the same return as a high paying job, right? So if you're a discovery CEO, the startup would give you the same returns as a discovery CEO job would. And 1% of the time, though, uh, you're going to hit the jackpot, if you will, right? I, 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 these are the numbers that are evident for everybody, right? So in this case of the I'm Ahmedabad uh, uh, fellow, he's right in 99% of the time, right? 99% of the time, your outcomes will be worse or uh, equal to your, uh, like, uh, to your job, right? Uh, to the day job, to the, to a normal job, right? But 1% of the time, it's very clear, right? That the startup outcomes are extraordinary, right? Because the whole point of a startup is that you're going to compress 40 years of work in four years. That means you're, go you're going to work with that four years of manic pace that you, rather than low intensity work for 40 years, you're going to do four years of very, very high intensity work. And proportionately, you'll get very, very high returns out of it, right? So there's no comparison, I would say. In the one percent probability that you succeed, uh, the uh, the financial returns are very outsized. But right. you have to, but you have to believe that you have the, like uh, now I by see the by that time I was very comfortable taking these one percent chances, right? Like right. Uh, when you take a leap of faith of writing a novel, you also know that there's a one percent chance that it'll be published and become a bestseller. And I kind of started to formulate in my life that. Uh, a bit life is like a slot machine, right? You don't know um, when you'll hit the jackpot, when you'll fail, uh, but you have to play the slots with 100% energy every day. And that's the only gift you owe life that you just come and take your bet with 100% energy, play the slots if you will. And sometimes it's gonna be a big failure and sometimes it's gonna be a big success, but if you don't play the slots at all, then uh, there's no chance at all, right? So for the last 10, 12 years, I've just been playing slots with very high energy, right? I've come come every day with this very high energy that I'm gonna write uh, like a great novel, right? That really means something and uh, and and turn it into a really big bestseller. So I've, I've kind of played that with this idea and I, I think that's totally fine, right? The, the great part about it is that I feel that even if you fail in these endeavors, you transform so much in the journey that uh, if you go back to a really normal thing, you are uh, supercharged, you know, in those, in that kind of normal endeavor, if you will, so yeah. But you were clear in your mind that you're starting doing this startup to scale it up and exit. It wasn't uh, follow my heart and let's see whether it makes money. That wasn't the philosophy which... See, follow my heart and make money at age 41 uh, or whatever, 39 or whatever, right? With mm. two kids is not like a... But I, would have, I did that in 28 when I followed my heart and left my job and backpacked, right? So I had a clear business plan that out on how it could succeed, right? And how it could great, get, deliver great outcomes. But you have to believe in what you're doing. In the end... The startup will uh, will earn value only if you create value, right? If you create a value for a million people, then a startup will give you a million dollars. If you create a value for a hundred million people, then you'll get a hundred million, like whatever. The larger the imp uh, the value creation that you'll do, the the better the value you'll get, right? So you obviously have to have the very core thesis that you're going to create a lot of value. And that means that you are creating something that the uh, people uh, like at, the, at a very large scale will want, right? So uh, so that I knew, I, when I went into it, I was like, look, uh, I think uh, I can create value at a very large scale here. Yeah. All right. My one last question before I open it to the audience Q and A. Uh, you know the situation of uh, let's say finding your job without a purpose, or how you put it, feeling of emptiness, uh, having to find the empty well. 
uh, honestly, that has just crossed the mind of maybe most of the participants on this call and even my uh, my call as well, uh, my mind as well. But most of us, you know, rationalize it with parental expectations, societal pressure, right. or what have you. And I'm sure that might start cross your mind as well, if not now, at least the first time you did it. Uh, so how did you cope up with the inevitable reaction of family, friends, society, you know? Because your background too is not one of privilege. You also came from okay. army background. So yeah. no. how do you cope up with it and give it all up? It's, it's hard, yeah. The, see, the thing is, the first leap is hard, right? So for me, as I said, the first leap is hard, right? When I was leaving, it was the same thing, right? I was like uh, hitting 30, not married, and I was like leaving my job to backpack. There was not even a big cause, right? Now, at least you're saying I'm... By the, if you're saying that I'm leaving for a startup, at least has more, at least a credibility that you're trying to make money, right? I had left to do really in some, in the world's view, nothing really, right? Then the second time I left, I had to, now you had my wife, right? She's an American, obviously she's not Indian, but um, but her family also has the same questions, right? At 35, instead of having kids, you're leaving to learn yoga in an ashram, right? Obviously, you know, they are also not very happy, right? So in the end, I don't, I think it's hard right? There is no easy answer to that. But I would say the one principle I've learned in life is that uh, life will reward extraordinary growth of an individual. An individual who goes through extraordinary growth will be rewarded disproportionately by life. It's a, life is very fair, right? So let me put it this way. Systems are unbelievably fair in the long run and quite unfair in the short run, right? In the short run, you go through ups and downs and the long run systems are just incredibly fair is what I've learned, right? So I, uh, so I think uh, if you're choosing an extraordinary growth outcome, life in the long run will reward you with extraordinary output, right? I'm 100% I'm crystal clear on that, right? So if I look at my first extraordinary growth event of really traveling, building this vision of a boundaryless world, writing, it was very profound growth, right? I came back on my sister's couch, so I can't say it rewarded me. But if you look at it in the long run, uh, this feeling of a very boundaryless world, which kind of started to come from the first year, months of backpacking alone in South America, etc. When I launched uh, Whitehead Junior, I was so confident within eight months of the market working out in India that this will work in the US, right? So it was most entrepreneurs in India would struggle with this act of launching in the US, right? I launched in the US very quickly, it did very well in the US. That led to the kind of the, the surge in revenue valuation subsequently. Now we have launched in UK, Australia, etc. We were and like this idea of a very boundaryless world was planted in those days of backpacking. And I mean, as I'm saying, in the long run, life rewards extraordinary growth. So now I think, uh, like, you know, you just have to kind of choose that, right? And, uh, and, 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 uh, and I, I do believe that life will reward it. Yeah. All right. So, Karan, yeah. I'm now, as I said, I'll be opening it to audience questions. Sure. And as discussed, I will not be censoring anything. Uh, no, of course. Uh, no, yeah, yeah. I will open discussion. So let yeah. me just go to Q&A tab. Uh, the first question is, how important really was the financial security for you each time you took the leap? The question has put the leap in quotes. So, you know, he's... See, I was very mathematical. I would be very clear in saying I was very mathematical. My mathematics always were that uh, there is a rule of thumb in the US, which is very similar in every market, that your salary divided by $20,000 is the amount of time it takes to find a new job. So if you're, if you're making $200,000, it'll take you 10 months to find a new job, right? Worst case scenario, right? Obviously, if you have networks, if you get a sabbatical from your job, etc., all those are good scenarios. But in the worst case scenario, when you have a $200,000 job, it'll take you 10 months to find a job, right? That's an average, uh, that's what's going to happen, right? In a bad economy, it'll go up a little bit. In a, in a good economy, it'll go li less a little bit. As long as I had that cushion, I was very comfortable. So, so to give you like uh, my last leap, right? Uh, when I'd done the calculation, I I, uh, I had two kids that time, right? Like my kids were very young, right? And I taken I I decided to be a full time writer in New York, right? And that to New York is an expensive city to live in, right? I didn't decide to move to India or whatever. So for eighteen months, I calculated that look, uh, I have eighteen months before I hit red alert on my finances, so I'm gonna be a full time writer for eighteen months and take a see if that works out, right? So I did that for exactly eighteen months, and then I was like, okay, financial red alert now. You know, I have to, I, so it was like 18 months of being a full-time writer. Then I'll start looking for a job, right? So I did 18 months of full-time writing. Then I started looking for a job and I found a job in one month as the discovery CEO in India, right? So it, I didn't, but, but I was quite mathematically prepared. That will take, I had about 36 months of cushion. I would spend 18 months and my salary at that time was, would have been at a point where it took me about 
uh, you know, salary divided by 20,000 would have been probably 18, 18 months or something like that. So there was still this left brain, right brain balance. Very, very much. Always. I, I was clear. Like I was never in doubt that look. And, and during that 18 months, then I was like, I'll be completely patient and see this through, uh, which means that I will be a full-time writer. I won't kind of like uh, fold in the middle. The next question is actually quite an interesting one. Uh, the question is, do you think the traditional education, you know, the, the bits I am was an advantage or actually it was a disadvantage and you have to really unlearn to really find your call or find your path? I mean, a huge advantage, right? See, as I said, uh, uh, bits, I am, PNG, even if you're sleeping on your sister's couch, it takes you three months to find a BCG, right? I mean, I can't say... Like if I didn't have this pedigrees and the PNG pedigree after that, it would take me maybe longer, right? To kind of like, but I, like, as I said, I was um, like pretty much broke, but I found a job, right? And I, I mean, I would give a lot of credit to it, to my pedigree in a way, right? Uh, so, so I can never say it's in any form a disadvantage. I think it's the greatest advantage. I think the question was more directed towards you, you know, uh, taking those unconventional steps as a learning, yeah. and also the entrepreneurial jump. Do you think the structured educational that you went through, the so-called premium institutes, did it actually, was a hindrance or was it a, you know? So there's a, there is a good saying, right, which is that at, at, at age 30, right, you should stop blaming your parents for your issues, right? Around at age 30, you should stop blaming your parents for all your life's issues, right? Uh, till 30, it's okay, right? You can blame your parents for, so in the same way, I think education institutions are the same, right? Till about age 30, probably you can blame them for shaping your mind in a certain way. But after age 30, you know, hopefully you're living a life that is rich enough to shape your mind. So I would say till age 30, maybe it would have been uh, the, the legacy of like the, the institutions of like structured thinking, the comparisons that come into these institutions. Ki, wo kya kar rahe, tum kya kar rahe ho? Kon CEO bana, kon president bana? Till about age 30, you know, you're probably in that same rut, right? As, uh, but at around, around then your, your mind should kind of open up, right? If you're reading a lot, if you're like, if your imagination is uh, ripe because you are kind of reading, traveling, at around around that mark, you should get start to get independent in your thinking, right? So, so I think I can't uh, like I, I can uh, no, I would never blame beyond age thirty to their credit or discredit to either my parents or my institutions. All right. <laughs> uh, the next question from uh, our participants is. Okay, this is a more on your personal side, less on your professional side. Right. What is your support structure? How does your family enable something that requires so much uh, energy? Uh, it's a very good question, Yar. I think uh, your spouse is the best decision that anybody can make, right? Or, or I mean, that's the only thing that matters, I would say. Like the spouse is the, like, the most important uh, decision in a way that an entrepreneur makes, right? Without even knowing that they're making it. Because... Uh, there is a huge level of like uh, understanding like so so my wife had always uh, like nobody could really understand me right in a way that uh, like see her my wife's parents would say is it, like why would a discovery ceo leave his job to become a 20 year old who's starting a startup in the like it's very hard to explain that to people right but my wife had always understood that i was a bit like i just had a very strong creation impulse right i like to create things i like scale uh, so, so, so I think she understood me very well. Right? So she was a very, like, so, so through all of this stuff, right. And she's understood the creative restlessness, if you will, right. That the creation, the creator will get restless, right. Uh, the, the, the creation impulses. And she's understood that in a way that's very hard to explain to people, right. That why would you leave like a very high paying discovery job to like, uh, like to take a 1% chance again, that to once again, right. Like, uh, after having done like multiple of these before and and not having really a big track record of them uh, working out or giving extraordinary returns, right? But you have to follow that impulse. I think a lot of credit to the spouse and the partner. Yeah. So then you do believe that behind every successful man is a woman asking him to do the dishes? <laughs> behind every successful man, there is a woman asking him to do the dishes? Yeah. Oh, I didn't even know this phrase. This is the first time I'm hearing it. I just made it up. But <laughs> okay. the, the, the old fashioned cliche that behind every successful man is a woman. And that but that's where the old best. So you do believe that yeah, yeah, the choice course, of yeah, partner yeah. definitely. Either, either ways. I, behind every successful woman, obviously, there's a partner who's supported or who believes. I, but both ways, I think, really. I think the partner is the best, uh, most important decision you can make, right? And uh, like, I think the, the depth in which they can understand you and understand the impulses, I think sometimes she's able to articulate my restlessness better for me in that way. A lot of credit to her. Yeah. 
Okay, so we can go to the next question in the list. Uh, what did you learn from this one year at the yoga uh, retreat that you had? And how did this really contribute to your extraordinary growth that you refer to? A lot, right? So a lot at multiple levels, right? So there is a stoic idea of uh, willful poverty, right? So the, the stoicism of willful poverty, I read this idea later, actually, after the yoga thing, right? But the idea is that, look, um, everyone, right, should for a, like, uh, for a period of time, right, and frequent periods of time, live uh, in poverty, right, with very little. Because it's very important for the soul to realize that it needs very little to get by, right? And, and you don't realize it, right? So once what happens is that if you're living in Singapore, you've got a comfortable life, you, you have your maids and your food and you're running and you start to feel that, look, these are all the things that I need to be uh, to live a productive life. I need healthy food. I need uh, like a, a nanny, a kid, this, that, a school district, etc. right? Now, if you deconstruct that completely and you live in complete poverty, right? Uh, sooner your soul starts to realize that it, it so, so in that year, right? Uh, I, we, my wife and I, or that time she was my partner, my girlfriend, she, we went from Europe to India by road, right? And the idea was that we'd go, we'd take the cheapest mode of transport everywhere. So we just had our backpacks and we were taking, taking trains, buses, road, we would not take a flight, right? We reached an ashram. The ashram was very bare, right? Uh, and the whole idea was that we would live in this, uh, then, then I did the Camino de Santiago, which is a 30 days uh, hike, right? Uh, in which you're just walking every day, right? So. The, the 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 kind of the sinking of this feeling right very clearly that look i'm i'm very happy with very little right without the cliches that i don't like uh, it, it was very not very little very starkly very little right i uh, was very liberating right i think i always had that feeling but after having lived that for a year i came back made completely authentic choices i was like look i'm a guy who can live on a ashram floor for a year right why do i need all these uh, things, right? So immediately after that, I came and became a writer full time after going back to the job, trying to get some money back in. But after that, I became a writer because I had this sense that you need very little, right? Because I lived it like that. Really right. deeply. Then on another level, I would say the whole yoga Buddhism journey, again, has been very formative for me because uh, like, if you really ask me, what do I want to become, right? I really like, I think I'm very influenced by this kind of Buddhist thing that like, I just want to become nothing, right? In a way, I just want to have no sense of identity at all, right? So whenever people try to pigeon, uh, want me to be a startup expert or a writing thing, I, I like to break all those things completely and become a beginner in a new field again and have, again, that feeling of complete humility of being a zero. Uh, and I think I've, I really felt that that's very important to my life, right? So during the discovery days, when people were starting to think of me as some visionary CEO, there was this restlessness that I want to be a zero again, right? Uh, and, and I like that a lot, right? Even now, I'll abandon this field after a couple of years and become uh, like start in a new field altogether, because I like this Buddhist humility of being a zero, of completely losing yourself and trying to climb a learning mount, a mountain of tough learning, reaching some kind of a peak there and then becoming a zero again, right? So, so, so I think multiple times, I think those decisions I've taken when, for example, my first two novels had done very well in India, they're being made, they, they were bought into movies and all that. But uh, I, I think I kind of, at, at that exact stage, I decided to kind of leave India writing and start get, try to get published in the US. When I got published in the US, I decided to leave writing altogether and uh, like start a tech company because I like this idea of being a zero, a beginner again and again, right? That's very, I think that's really helped me a lot in many ways, right? Because otherwise it's very easy to get fixated into the hype around you, right? Now he's a great startup guy. He'll become an advisor, a mentor, a, like I don't do all any of that, right? I, I just like become a zero again. So I like that feeling of being nothing. Yeah. So if I were to paraphrase, you'll say that this uh, stint at the ashram, the spiritual philosophical yeah. part of it, help you realize that it's help you realize that you need very little, although the world might expect a lot, you right. have a lot. Right, right. You need very little. And then uh, my greatest joy is in learning and climbing a new mountain and abandoning it at the peak. A peak is a relative term, right? But uh, like uh, like the like the king abandoning a conquered kingdom, right? There's sort of a feeling. I, I like that feeling that look, uh, become a zero again, right? It's very important. Otherwise, the soul gets very cluttered with the uh, with the baggage of being an expert and uh, like somebody with an identity, right? He's the startup guru. He's this novelist, right? I I, I want to be like basically uh, like a, a a nobody, right? I I I think that's the like the Buddhist way of living. My life is to be a nobody again and again. 
Yeah. It sounds uh, current eerily familiar with how Ashok felt after the Kalinga Wars, you know. The, okay, the right, right, right. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. right. The questions are coming in thick and fast. Let me ask, go to the next question. Um, uh, one question. Uh, if you don't yes, mind. yes. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I just saw one of the uh, participant questions. Very interesting, Karan. Uh, you've had a number of, you've done a number of things. You had, you know, your spiritual pursuits um, and then you've, you know, you've obviously sold a company, so you had, you know, successes in the material sense. How do you define success for yourself? Um, I think success, uh, I think it's very easy for me to define. I think uh, basically losing yourself completely without any sense of identity uh, is, I think, uh, like, uh, like a complete kind of dissolution, if you will, or dissolving in your work, I think is the only success that's possible in the world, right? Otherwise... Uh, yeah, so, so in a way, I think that's how I define success, that I'm, I'm, am I in a, a field of work or am I doing something in which I'm completely lost in the field itself and not in the, and if I'm doing that, then I feel I'm successful. And the moment I feel that I'm not doing it, I'm very easy, easy to abandon it, right? I'm, so, so for example, the Discovery CEO job, I felt I was uh, not lost in learning anymore. I was just meeting the prime minister, doing all these things. And I was like, that's not my destiny. Uh, and I uh, left it and like wanted to learn again, right? Build a tech product with my hands. I did this. Soon I'll reach a point here also in a few years where I'll be like, uh, I like I take the, took this company, I expanded it. I learned a lot in that process. Now I have to be a complete, uh, abandon everything and become a, like, like just be in the process of like dissolving myself and learning something new rather than in the, so, so yeah. So I think that's success, right? Own, owning nothing, just being constantly, uh, like in the process of learning, uh, be becoming lost in the learning, I think is success. Yeah. Yeah. So, Karan, now I'm going to start combining a bit of questions, uh, keeping sure, sure, one eye sure. on the clock. So, the next question is I'm kind of combining two questions. Um, sure. You know, your individual chapters of success and as a corporate professional, as author, and as an entrepreneur. But right now, how do you drain your well? Is your well empty? And what does Karan Bajaj do next? Um, for the next couple of years, I'm quite set because right now I'm in the process of taking the company, uh, scaling the company globally, mm -hmm. right across multiple uh, markets. It's the first time I'm 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 doing this on a like a like a a true B two C business globally is very hard to create from India, right? Uh, to create a product that is strong enough for all all across the world, we are seeing. So I'm I'm quite uh, and then I'm launching new products within that, right? So at this point, I would say the exit with Beju came almost halfway into my climbing the mountain of a startup, right? Or even halfway as in a quarter of the way. So I'm going to kind of complete this mountain to its peak, right? And then I'll, uh, then I'll leave and do something completely uh, distinct, right? I would never do a tech startup again, for example. But you, right now, you don't really have idea where to next? Where no, because it comes to me. I read, I read a lot. I, I like, I'm very curious and I read a lot. So I think slow, during a climbing of a mountain uh, and an idea formulates, right? Um, and, and it could be something very diverse, right? Like, uh, but I, I have a general sense that I'll create something and I'll try to do it at a very large scale. So suppose, I, for example, suppose I get into a movie, uh, like, uh, like I'll, I'll go to film school or something, and I'll, I'll want to create a film that millions of people see, right? That would be interesting as a project that I would take on next, for example. Because it's right. got a lot of learning to it and it's right. got a scale and impact and every uh, creation. So I'll take up a big creative project that has a large scale impact next. But not a tech startup again, and nor will I invest in any tech startups and all of that stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, the next question is um, I think I combined that. Uh, you spoke about how you support women in the white engineer journey yeah. and how you have designed an organization that is extremely empathetic to the situation. Can you elaborate that and difference with respect to the hyper growth uh, mindset of yours? Um, yeah, no, I think uh, the great part about education is uh, as, as a sector, it's one sector where you, uh, you do good and you make good sort of a thing, right? Uh, very hard to find those kind of sectors where the more good you do, the more money you make in a way, right? They're like very, very hard to find these kind of sectors, right? So education uh, is one of those uh, sectors, right? So uh, like I, I have a stronger kind of mission about it, which is uh, the, the women in India. My mom was a very qualified lady, right? She was uh, so smart, so intelligent. And uh, since my dad was in the army, she kept following him around and could never have a career of her own, right? So when I started Whitehead Junior, I really believed that there is a huge base of such women in India and the ability to give them a work from home job uh, where they'll be able to teach kids from all over the world. 
and it played out exactly like that right now the now the women in, in uh, teaching are making more than an iit graduate or an im graduate right because we have kids from all over the world and uh, and it's like in a way that's what i always wanted right that women should be able to have their uh, like uh, like the the natural law, law of having kids and taking care of them and yet be able to have completely productive careers for themselves right so i really believed in that i think that was how white junior manifested and actually the better we are doing for the women right uh, getting helping them make more money through more kids from outside uh, international uh, the more money they are making the more loyal they are to the platform the better they kind of do with the kids the more the word of mouth spreads the more the revenue grows right so it's one of those virtuous cycles in which the better you do the the more the you know the more goodness you bring into your system the better the output is from a financial return perspective um you talked a lot about your life after the your im phase but i haven't talked much about before that who were your influences which or who influenced you in your thinking or in your world view of life apart from the okay. experience any people or any authors any writers teachers yeah uh, so raskin bond a uh, very very big influence pre im i would say um i i visited him also because i liked the idea of a uh, of a guy who was uh, sitting on the edge of society right in a way he was writing uh, mainstream but he was uh, he didn't seem to be very impacted by the results of it and he was sitting in masuri just writing he didn't attend any events and stuff so i like the idea of being just on the edge of the mainstream which is do productive work uh, which is mainstream but be at the out edge outer edges of it right so i like that idea always uh, pre im and then within the im also i think i got fortunate like i was fortunate that way that i had a very clear sense when i came in that uh, that i'll do well here like you know the but i uh, but i'll be at the edge of it right i'll do well but i don't care that much about uh, getting the best job on campus or the, like like none of those uh, traditional markers impact me that much so i did exactly that in i am i did reasonably well but i was uh, doing my own thing you know yeah okay yeah rahul why do you combine a few questions i'm going to ask a quick question Okay. Yeah. yeah i know uh, your wife has written about sleep so the yeah. specialist how important do you think is sleep for being successful very important i think the founders energy will drive the organization right if the founder is a, a completely uh, you know like if the founder drives himself right morning to night and is into every detail the energy of the organization becomes that right and the founders energy is a complete output of their lifestyle so in some senses i think uh, one of the reasons i would say vita junior did well was uh, that my energy was very high and as a result the whole organization around me built a very high energy right and that was because i was uh, meditating like my meditation practice is strong my yoga is strong my sleep is good because of the yoga and meditation i eat quite healthy i am very very healthy in fact so so i think all of the founder energy uh, inputs right uh, are very critical to the startup right so at a 40 year old i could uh, as a 40 year old i was uh, giving the 21 22 23 year olds who are going to make up a startup by the way the 40 year olds actually don't make up a startup till the next stage of growth right uh, when you hire your ceos and stuff till the early phase of the startup you're making to, you're working with 20 25 year olds right and they struggle to keep up with me right which was very good uh and and if if i uh, if i had lost my energy i think it's very easy for 25 year olds to start to slack you know so 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 i think it's very 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 important i think yeah. so you attribute the energy to your lifestyle and the success yeah. to your energy in that sequence 100% the li- lifestyle of right uh, meditating in the morning meditating in the night i do yoga three four times a week on my own because i uh, like uh, learn to be a teacher i sleep less than i want to probably i, I because i work a lot but the 6 six, six and a half hours of sleep is very deep because of the meditation before it and the meditation after it right my day bookmarks with meditation in the morning and the night half of an hour each very very helpful so kar the next question is also a bit on your personal side uh it says are you and your wife uh, you know bringing up your children differently from your own upbringing and if yes in what way and why i mean we are very lax here I, i i like i think we should be better parents right i think uh, see the thing is the surprising thing is uh, in my heart i have a parenting philosophy which is also kind of research based right the the parenting philosophy i i read this wall street journal research which i thought was very impactful right where uh, the number of books in your house 
has a higher correlation with your kid's reading ability than how much you read to your kid. So okay. said another way, the kid uh, picks up the environment in the house and not what you're telling them. So if you come and read to them every day and you tell them reading is important, it has no correlation with their ability as readers. But if you never read to them, but you read yourself all the time, your kid will become a great reader. So in a way, the kid is going to emulate you, right? The tree, the fruit will not fall far from the tree. Mm -hmm. So in a way, my parenting philosophy was that whatever I uh, want my kid to become first, I should become myself, right? So, so from the moment my kids came, my risk taking became even bigger, right? Uh, I would leave my jobs to do big, like, you know, I left my job to, uh, we moved to India, then I left to do a startup. Because in my heart, it was the idea was that, look, if I want my kids to become risk takers who treat life like an experiment, a playground of creation, building, then I have to show that. If I'm showing them that I'm afraid to leave a job, then, you know, at 25, they'll be very afraid to leave a job, right? At 40, they'll also be very afraid to leave a job. So in a way, I would say my parenting is almost uh, try to become who I want my kids to become. And then after that, uh, let them see it and let them do what they have to do. So we are very, very poor parents, I think. I mean... <laughs> Like in the sense, like, I just feel like self-improvement is the best thing I can do as a parent and let me do that and let me be a role model. That's it. So I think, Karan, that's simply put, but quite deep at the same same time, you know, quite zen-like. So I, I kind of, I think, uh, I'll remember that sentence for a long time. Uh, the next uh, question uh, we have is, uh, this again is more on your personal side. Uh, this question, they really want to know how, can you share a bit more about how really meditation has really helped you? Tremendously. I was the, the best thing that happened to me, I think, in some ways. Uh, I, I started in 2013, right, when I was getting into this phase of, uh, like, uh, like, uh, like when my mom passed away, I was really trying to understand the meaning of life and enlightenment, moksha, vagara. So I started to get into it with, a, with not with the intent of making my life productive, right? I just got into it with the intent of, like, uh, like finding moksha or something. I was very deep into it, right? So I read a lot, studied a lot, uh, was in an ashram, right? But after that, I came back and it became more like a productivity tool without that being the original intention. It's unbelievably helpful, right? I uh, meditate in the morning. I feel very calm. Then as the day builds up, obviously, I get more and more frenzied because I'm kind of pretty high energy, very like, you know, a bit of a creative soul, like uh, over decisive, like try to make decisions too quickly. Then by, by then in the night, I calm down again with the meditation, right? I think it basically what happens is that it, it breaks, um, it causes a little bit of a pause between the thought and action cycle. So I, if I was not meditating, I would get irritated with people very easily, right? Because I'm getting irritated, I'll speak my, like, but here I can pause for a second, I can see that I'm getting irritated and I, the act of noticing it calms me down immediately. So I think meditation has been very helpful because it's kind of uh, slowed me, it's made me very aware of what I'm feeling and as a result, my actions change based on that, right? As a result, my days are relatively calm. I think I'm a much better leader than I would have been otherwise. Um, yeah, so I think huge, huge impact in my life. And the next question, again, a combination of several questions. Quite a few people have asked this, and I think yeah. uh, it's playing on everyone's mind. On one hand, you say you have to become a zero, you know, every time lean when give yeah. it up all, being very stoic and willful poverty, as you put it. On the other hand, there are all this $300 million talks that <laughs> right. in the room. How do you reconcile these two? Do you I mean, think you come with zero after this? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. See, the thing is, um, I, I don't know, Madhav. Like every endeavor I've done in the last ten years have been. Uh, so when I wrote my third novel, I like like marketed with this idea that like hundreds of millions of people all over the world would read it. Like they didn't. See, but uh, the intention of creating anything has been create something that has large scale enduring value. And uh, that's just, as I said, it's my dharma. I'm going to do that, right? If I make a movie next, I'm going to do it with the same idea that it should have, uh, like millions of people should, will see it. It's powerful enough to impact millions of people, right? Sometimes it's going to work. Sometimes it's going to not. And like, it's, it's, I've been kind of like pretty much like detached from that outcome for a while now. Having said that, I mean, I don't want to be a hypocrite. The money does uh, make it a little bit, a e lot of life much easier. I, I don't, I can't deny that because... Uh, until then, all these risks were a bit, uh, you know, like like I was just kind of taking the leaps into the unknown with an abyss at the bottom. Now you have a, a cushion at the bottom, a very significant cushion, you know, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy about it. Yeah, definitely. So you don't see that unexpected richness changing you fundamentally as a person? Or, you know? No, nothing. nothing. Right. I, I live very barely. I don't have uh, like too many 
the, the things that I enjoy are all free, right? But it's just given me more freedom to make my risks, uh, take my decisions. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, uh, people have read and heard all about the white hat exit, but do you have any moments of uh, failure? And they're not referring to your earlier thing, which you explained in your discovery phase during your white hat journey, where you took a wrong calls or wrong decisions. A lot of them. See, startups are by its nature, uh, like like a series of these, right? A misadventures, right? Uh, by its nature, that's that's just the nature of a startup. So, I hired a CTO too late. Uh, our tech product was very buggy for the for the first year, right? Uh, a lot of lot of mis 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 decisions, right? Uh, I would say. So, so 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 like I mean, tech and product built very late for us. Uh, then uh, like because because I was a little lax on hiring that and not understood it very well because I was never a tech person myself. I understood it very late. Um, yeah, but but you know nothing, nothing outside the realm of uh, like like what would happen in a typical startup. Yeah. Uh, how how important was the initial funding to you? Would you have still done the startup if you hadn't got funded? Oh uh, yes, I would have done the startup. Yeah, I would have done the startup if I hadn't got funded because. Um, the, the venture capitalist world, anywhere in the world, not just in India, would expect you to leave the job when you are pitching, right? Uh, so part of my agreement when the $1.3 million came uh, in order to sign the final document, I had to have a, like I had to give my resignation from discovery as a proof, right? Uh, as a proof. And that was the expectation, right? So I made up my mind to do it full time. And I would not, I would have done it without, without the funding, but the funding was very, very helpful. It helped me build a team get in get enough uh, spending for user acquisition to show in a, enough consumer traction in the beginning very very helpful yeah uh, okay this is a bit of a longish question I, i'm aware we got only five to seven minutes so i'll try to kind of pick up the ones that are more important many of the challenging problems in the world require deep expertise and working on it for your full life for example people working on research on specific social impact okay. projects like climate change cure yeah. for disease etc what can they really learn from the going back to zero framework? Uh, not much. I think the thing is that, uh, I mean, I think the, there is a role for very, very deep vertical expertise, right? As you rightly said, deep problem solving in climate change or even Warren Buffet, who's done or spent all his life in mastering investing. But I think my point is that there, are, there is a role for people like us who are meanders and wanders, uh, right? So I was never an expertise uh, like I, I was always a very curious, experimentative uh, person, right? My dad was in the army. It was a wandering spirit. After that, I traveled. So I was always a wanderer. I think there is a lot of role for people like us who combine multiple disciplines and uh, like who take their learnings from a little bit of writing, a little bit of yoga, a little bit of that, and combine that into creating something, and then take the learning from that and combine. So there's a lot of role for a multidisciplinary a wide skill set, uh, like just basically curious people, right? So I think for that, I would say uh, there's a role for everyone. And if you're like that, you should not pigeonhole yourself, right? I, I would have been a very, if I'd pigeonhole myself as a Procter & Gamble consumer marketer, I would be a, like a shadow of what my life would have been, right? So I think, you know, we, uh, like there's a role for us who just leave and do their things. Yeah. Okay, the next question is, what would you advise uh, Fresh I am alumnus today. Just to build stuff early. Like right, like okay. build, create something early. Like create a novel, uh, like a music album, a startup, right? Do some create creation act early because I I I think it's a very kind of a, like a very important mechanism to uh, to take your take the well that you've filled up and convert it into a like to turn it into something, right? Uh, changes your life a lot, right? Building something changes your life. All right. Uh, the world who made this uh, million dollars, would this be also your own definition of success? If now, uh, if not, then what will it be? Uh, sorry, if what? Could you repeat that question? The world's calling you successful because uh, you made this three hundred million dollar exit. But would that be your definition of being successful? And if that wouldn't be, then what would have been your own definition of being successful? 
<laughs> external markers are important uh, in that way, right? Uh, like uh, writing a novel is a success in itself because it consumes you, but the act of publishing it is uh, like uh, gives you the, the kind of the validation that what you've done is, a, is at a certain standard, right? Uh, otherwise, you are just on your own validation. So, so it's a bit of a validation on climbing, uh, like reaching some kind of a peak of the mountain, if you will. Uh, external validation. So I treat it like that. I think exiting a startup, giving investors a return to the startup uh, is, a, like, uh, is, is a marker of su success in some kind. It means that you've created a structurally solid, uh, ethically run, honest business, right? Because uh, you've passed the diligence, you've created a business that's valued very highly. Uh, so yeah, so it's important. I guess the markers are important, but uh, in the end, the, the act of building and creation is success, right? This is just a uh, this is the end of the journey, like not the journey itself, obviously. Yeah. All right. So Karan, I think we're only three minutes left. So I'll just ask you one last question before sure. we kind of officially start winding it up. Uh, what would be, uh, I don't know whether you would give the same answers before, but the question, I'll ask the question anyway. Uh, the question is, what would be your advice to individuals looking to start their own entrepreneurial journey? I mean, Which may or may not be young. I mean, it might be a bit older than. A yeah, yeah, might my, 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 my age, right? Forty yeah. or whenever they start yeah. up, right? So the thing is, uh, as I said, I think you should first have this very clear internal thought that systems are incredibly efficient in the long run. So if you're spending one more year at a job where you're not going to learn, uh, or your learning is going to be incremental, and your learning in a startup is going to be definitely dramatic. If you're not a tech person, you're going to build a tech product from scratch. You're going to have dramatic learning the world will reward you for the dramatic learning. Whether the startup works or not, uh, nobody can say. But uh, assuming the startup doesn't work and you come back to the regular world, the world will really value you for being a person who knew tech inside out, for example, right? Or who knew how to kind of build a team inside out or who knew, in some form or the other, you learn so much through the startup journey. So I would say your risk is, uh, is very mitigated in a way, right? Because uh, the output of that will come if you've, if you've chosen a very dramatic growth path. Right. Uh, so, so the output of it will come uh, in, in some way. Right. So I would say, I would say, don't worry too much. Right. Take the plunge quickly. Second point I would say is to do it with hundred percent full consumption. Have a talk with your spouse, with your family and say that, look, leave me alone for the next couple of years. Right. I'm going to be just 24 seven maniacally working on it. Leave alone all thoughts of a, a backup plan. Right. Which is uh, like joining a job again or keeping your networks going just do it very manically, right? Uh, as I said, 10, 10, 6, 10 to 10, 6 days a week, uh, right? Just do this and do nothing else, right? Forget even the kids in the wild for a while, just for a couple of years, just give yourself completely to it and operate like uh, very strongly in those years, right? I think if you do these two things, I think your probability of success will go up. All right, Karan, yeah. so I know you had mentioned you have a hard stop at uh, three or four yeah. times. So yeah, respecting yeah. that, uh, I think yeah, thanks. Yeah. That was a great story, an inspiring one, a story that needed to be told, a story that needed to be heard. And more importantly, I think a story that needs to be lived. While it might be late for a few people on the participants to do that, hopefully it gives a thought to pass on to the next generation of theirs. I can only say on behalf of the Singapore alumni that you do the alumni proud, you do the I am proud, and of course you do India proud. So on behalf of the Singapore alumni, we would like to yeah. wish you all the very best on emptying you. your well and filling it up again. Great. A real pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks Bye -bye. a lot, Kevin. Thanks a lot. It was a pleasure having you.